Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's 2020-2022 FOIA Advisory Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Please note all audio connections are currently muted and this conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the webinar, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the meeting over to David Berrio, Archivist of the United States. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you, and good morning, and welcome to the fourth meeting of the 2020 to 2022 term of the Federal Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee. I join you from the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples, which today is home to the flagship building on Pennsylvania Avenue of the National Archives. June marks several important historical moments in our rich American history, but there are two events that bear mentioning today. The first is June 19, 1865, two years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation when Union troops announced that an estimated 250,000 enslaved black Americans in Texas were free by executive order. Among the holdings of the National Archives that have been digitized for online viewing is that decree, General Order Number 3, read by Major General Gordon Granger to the people of Galveston. June 19th or Juneteenth, celebrating the emancipation of remaining enslaved black Americans in Texas, reminds us that black Americans helped build our great nation even when rights and liberties were denied them. Last year's national reckoning with issues of racial equity elevated the importance, important June commemoration in our country's historical consciousness. As part of that reckoning at the National Archives late last year, I convened a task force on racism and tasked it with identifying and recommending solutions to issues both explicit and implicit stemming from structural racism within the agency. I look forward to sharing more about the task force work in the coming months. June 19 is also of particular significance to the National Archives, as it was the day in 1934 that President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the law establishing the National Archives to centralize federal record keeping. The National Archives Act, called All Archives or Records of the United States Government, Legislative, Executive, or Judicial, to be under the charge of the Archivist of the United States. Workers from the Works Progress Administration, a Roosevelt New Deal agency, surveyed federal records nationwide, locating them in basements, attics, carriage houses, abandoned buildings, and alcoves with little security or regard for storage conditions. Today, the National Archives encompasses a nationwide network of federal record centers and presidential museums and libraries in 17 states and the District of Columbia. Like so many other historical and cultural institutions around the world, National Archives facilities have been physically shuttered by the pandemic for more than a year. While we've continued to make access happen in virtual spaces throughout the pandemic, all National Archives facilities are in some phase of reopening. We recently launched the pilot program to test bringing researchers back into the National Archives research rooms, and I'm pleased that the rotunda of the National Archives building here in Washington, as well as five presidential museum libraries, are open with limited capacity on select days. If local public health metrics remain below target for safe reopening, the rotunda also will be open on Monday, July 5th for the July 4th holiday weekend. Please visit the archives.gov for more information. FOIA advisory committee members, as we recall the founding of the National Archives as our nation's record keeper, I look forward to a bright future, including your work in the federal FOIA space. I understand for the first time since the committee's establishment in 2014, you all will formally consider a recommendation less than one year into your term. 
I appreciate your work on a recommendation regarding public access to legislative branch records, a timely topic. Public access to government records in all branches of government strengthens democracy by allowing Americans to claim their rights of citizenship, hold their government accountable, and understanding their history so they can participate more effectively in their government. Finally, the approach of the summer solstice and the long hours of daylight remind us that the long, dark winter of the pandemic will someday be behind us as we emerge from these pandemic times. Please continue to take care and stay safe. I now turn the meeting over to the committee's chair, Alina Simo. Great. Thank you so much, David. Really appreciate those great remarks. Um, as the director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, and this committee's chairperson, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the fourth meeting of the fourth term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I hope everyone who is joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. I want to welcome all of our committee members today and express my gratitude for your commitment to studying the current FOIA landscape and developing consensus recommendations for improving the administration of FOIA across the federal landscape. Uh, I would like to reintroduce to everyone the committee's design designated federal officer, DFO, Kirsten Mitchell. Uh, she is going to help me stay on track today, as she always does, and make sure that um, everything runs smoothly. Kirsten has taken a visual roll call of, and confirms we have a quorum. Unfortunately, we have two committee members who are not able to join us uh, this morning. Alexandra Perloff Giles is unable to join us. Linda Fry is unable to attend uh, the first part of the meeting, although she may join us later this morning if she is able. Since we're dispensing with the roll call, I'll just say a hello to everyone. Group hello. And good morning. Patricia West, who has been on the committee since the archivist appointed her in 2018, has recently changed agencies. Patricia is now Assistant General Counsel in the National FOIA Office of the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. In light of her move to, from the NLRB to the EPA, the archivist has reappointed Patricia to the committee, where she will continue to represent the interests of a non-cabinet level agency. We appreciate and thank EPA for its support of the advisory committee and the important work that we do. Thanks, Patricia. Um, I also want to welcome our colleagues and friends from the FOIA community and elsewhere who are watching us today either via WebEx or on NARA's YouTube channel. We have a busy agenda today, so I will do my best to make sure we stay on track and end on time and perhaps even a little bit early so I can give you some minutes back to your day. Despite today's full agenda, we will leave time at the end for public comments to allow the opportunity for any non-committee attendees to provide ideas or comments. A few words about public comments. We have received a number of written comments that we have posted on our website and we have shared them with committee members. Members of the public can submit public comments at any time by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at nara.gov. We read all public comments and consider them for posting in accordance with our posting policy for public comments, which is available on the FOIA Advisory Committee website. And we also share public comments with our committee members. Please note, the chat function in WebEx or the NARA YouTube channel is being monitored today, um, but it is not the proper forum to submit extensive public comments. You may submit public comments at any time by emailing our FOIA Advisory Committee mailbox, and we will consider posting them on our OGIS website. The chat function on both platforms should be used to ask clarifying questions or provide brief comments or questions that, we'll, that we will read out loud at the end of today's meeting. We will open up the telephone lines twice today, once uh, at the end of the deliberations of the committee on today's recommendation that will be presented by the legislation subcommittee, and at the end for the last 15 minutes of our meeting to receive any oral comments. Uh, meeting materials for this term, along with members' names, affiliations, and biographies are available on the committee's webpage. 
Uh, if you click on the link for the 2020 to 2022 FOIA Advisory Committee on the OGIS website, you will be able to access that. And there you will also find our agenda for today's meeting. We will upload a transcript and video of this meeting as soon as they become available. All submitted comments that are not case specific are also posted or will be posted on our website. A reminder that uh, the FOIA Advisory Committee is also not the appropriate venue for concerns about individual FOIA requests. If you need OGIS assistance, you may request it, but we ask that you not do so through the committee email. Please send us an email at OGIS at NARA.gov. It is hard to believe that we've been meeting virtually since March of 2020. The virtual environment has proven to have several advantages for all of us, including saving money on dry cleaning bills, uh, saving commute times, and achieving a better work life, home life balance. The disadvantage for me and Kirsten is that we are not always able to see committee members raising their hands or eagerly leaning forward to ask a question or make a comment as we would if we were meeting in person. Although I will be doing my best to monitor committee members' nonverbal cues during the webcast, uh, please all be respectful of each other and try not to speak over one another, um, although I realize that will be inevitable at times. I also want to encourage committee members to use the all panelists option from the drop-down menu in the chat function when you want to speak or ask a question in case we miss your verbal cue. You can also just chat me and Kirsten directly. As a reminder, however, in order to comply with the spirit and intent of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, committee members, please keep any communications in the chat function to only housekeeping or procedural matters. No substantive comments should be made in the chat function as they will not be recorded in the transcript of this meeting. Committee members, a reminder that I make every single time if you need to take a break, uh, please feel free to do so, but do not disconnect from either the audio or the video of the web event. Uh, instead, put your phone on mute and turn off your camera temporarily. Send a quick chat to me and Kirsten to let us know if you'll be gone for more than a few minutes and join us again as soon as you can. We are going to be taking a 15 minute break at approximately 11.30 a.m. on our agenda. We may break a little bit earlier or a little later depending on our discussions and our pace today. And a big reminder to everyone, I am equally guilty of this. Please identify yourself by name and affiliation each time you speak, if at all possible. This will help us uh, down the road with both the transcript and the minutes, both of which are required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. I'm going to move on now to the approval of the meeting minutes from our last meeting, March 3rd, 2020, uh, 2021, sorry. Minutes from that last meeting um, are, have been uh, written up by Kimberly Reed from the National Archives, and we thank Kimberly for that. Uh, Kirsten and I had to certify and post those meeting minutes online last week in order to comply with the 90-day deadline imposed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So we went ahead and certified the minutes to be true and correct, but if we missed anything, committee members, please let us know, and we can get that corrected. Before turning to our guest speakers, a quick update. Uh, since we last met on March 3rd, we have completed two prior FOIA Advisory Committee recommendations. Uh, so we're excited about that. And we have also updated our committee recommendations tracker accordingly. Uh, that means eight out of the 30 recommendations that have been made to date to the archivist, 22 of which were made in uh, the 2020 uh, term, 2018 to 2020 term, are now complete. Uh, recommendation number 2020-10 has now been completed. That recommendation called on NARA and DOJ to establish liaisons with the Chief Data Officers Council to ensure that council officials understand the importance of federal record keeping and FOIA requirements. The directors of OGIS and OIP, that's me and Bobby Talibian, and the, our Chief Records Officer for the United States Government, Lawrence Brewer, have now all been designated ex officio members of the CDO Council, and we will work to ensure that the Council understands the importance of federal record keeping and FOIA requirements. The complete recommendation number 2020-07 in full 
OGIS included in our May 2021 annual report to Congress and the President the results of our 2020 assessment on FOIA performance measures for non-FOIA professionals, which included four recommendations for agencies to take. And I invite everyone to the website uh, to, to look at that and study that further. Work on 17 FOIA advisory committee recommendations is in progress. Five recommendations are pending, which means work has not yet begun on them, but uh, we hope to do so in the not too distant future. So bottom line, stay tuned. Uh, work by OIP and OGIS continues. Um, we are working very cooperatively together, so I am extremely happy about that and thank Bobby for all the great cooperation. Uh, we've been regularly updating the recommendations dashboard, so please check back frequently. And um, special thank you to Krista Lemelin on our staff uh, for continuing to keep that dashboard up to date. In the past, I have mentioned that earlier this calendar year, um, our OGIS team launched five cross-training programs in which professionals from other National Archives offices have been assigned to OGIS on a part-time basis to work on completing past FOIA advisory committee recommendations. Those projects include compiling briefing material for new senior leaders, working with OIP and NARA's records management experts on uploaded on updated, sorry, training material, reviewing information agencies make available on their websites about the FOIA filing process, and reviewing agency performance plans to see if FOIA is included. That work continues, and we will publish the results of those efforts as soon as they are available for prime time, so please stay tuned. Also, please check out the FOIA Ombudsman blog where you can learn more about individual members of our committee through our Getting to Know the Committee Members blog post. A special thank you to Kimberly Reed. She's been doing an outstanding job with that. And uh, I thank all the committee members for uh, agreeing to share uh, a little bit about yourselves and, um, and letting everyone know what, um, what interests you and your work with FOIA. I'm gonna pause for a second to make sure that none of our committee members have any questions so far about anything I've gone over. Okay, great, everyone is raring to go. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next portion of our agenda, so it looks like we're right on track. Um, we are going to have a uh, briefing on legislative reform efforts today, and I am very pleased to welcome Emily Manna and Freddie Martinez from Open the Government, who will be providing us with an update on legislative efforts to reform FOIA. Emily Manna is the Policy Director at Open the Government, where her work focuses on transparency and accountability for U.S. military and national security programs, records management and data preservation, and expanding proactive disclosure and the public's right to know. Her opinions, writing, and research have appeared in numerous outlets, including Columbia Journalism Review, The New York Times, The Hill, The Houston Chronicle, The Nation, Roll Call, and on NPR member stations. Prior to joining Open the Government, Emily focused on civil liberties and human rights issues in the U.S. national security and foreign policy. Emily holds a master's in public policy from Georgetown University, where her research focused on the U.S. drone program. Freddie Martinez is a policy analyst at Open the Government, whose transparency work focuses on surveillance, immigration, and police accountability. His work has appeared in numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, Vice, Forbes, The Intercept, and the Chicago Sun-Times. He was previously a Mozilla Ford Foundation Open Web Fellow at the Freedom of the Press Foundation. We have agreed that uh, after their presentation, committee members will have the opportunity to ask questions, uh, make comments, and uh, have a dialogue with Freddie and Emily. Uh, so please hold your comments, save them, and I am now going to turn things over to Emily and Friday. So welcome. We're very happy to have you. Thank you so much, Alina. Thank you for the, for the introduction, and thank you so much for having us. We're really thrilled to be here talking to you all about uh, the work that we've been doing uh, over the past couple of years. Um, so for those who don't know uh, too much about Open the Government, we are a coalition of a little over 100 organizations, uh, a, a 
that vary across the political spectrum, across policy issue areas that are all uh, working to advocate for open government uh, and government accountability. And we have been working with uh, a smaller uh, subset of that coalition, uh, about 20 to, to 30 organizations, on a set of coalition uh, FOIA reform recommendations, uh, and that's what Freddie and I will be will be talking to you about today. Uh, before I kind of talk more about uh, you know what the, the substance of the reforms, I just want to tell you a little bit about how they came about. Um, uh, most of this uh, kind of emerged out of. Uh, the 2016 FOIA reform process and, and some of the coalition's priorities that did not make it into uh, that bill and, and also, you know, what we've seen in terms of how the 2016 uh, FOIA Improvement Act has, has been implemented and the extent to which agencies are, are successfully following the, the updates in that bill. Um, it's also some of the ideas in the, in, in our uh, reform recommendations come from uh, congressional staffers and, and their ideas and priorities. Some come uh, from other kind of uh, events in the FOIA world, such as the, the Arctic Leader Supreme Court decision, uh, and some just come from, you know, various organization priorities. And it's really kind of uh, this, this set of recommendations has emerged over uh, a couple of years of, of work and uh, discussion and conversation within the, the coalition to, until we've ended up now with, with the recommendations that we have here. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, we have uh, presented those in Congress. We, we have been having conversations with congressional offices uh, still have yet to see, you know, how much uh, of our reforms uh, they may uh, accept and, and sign on to and put into a bill. Um, but I do think, you know, that it's likely we will have a, a, a FOIA reform bill in, in some form this year. Um, but, you know, still, still uh, TBD really on, on what that will look like. Um, we are also... Uh, I will say, focused on, on an appropriation track as well. We recognize that, that resources are, are a significant uh, part of, of the problem in terms of FOIA backlog delays, uh, et cetera. And, uh, so we are pushing for um, in increases in FOIA resources across the board as well. And uh, Freddie will talk a, a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so. You know, now I'd just like to go through uh, a kind of overview of, of the, the issues that our reforms are, are trying to tackle, and then I'll, I'll let Freddie do a deeper dive. And then hopefully uh, we'll leave some time at the end for, for any questions or discussion. So our, our set of recommendations uh, aims to address um, three main kind of uh, thematic uh, areas. Of FOIA, and those are preventing overredaction and improper withholding of information, minimizing delays and improving efficiency, and protecting and strengthening fiscal and corporate transparency. Those are the three areas. So for that first area, preventing overredaction and improper withholding of information, the reforms that we've kind of uh, isolated over the past couple of years include uh, narrowing of, of the B7F, uh, uh, exemption um, to to kind of prevent uh, agencies from withholding information based on a kind of nebulous uh, idea of, of potential harm from disclosure, uh, a clarification of uh, the remedial power of federal courts to order an agency to comply with FOIA, uh, and the main need of that is, is allowing courts to order uh, public disclosure um, rather than simply release of a document to a complainant. And the, the biggest uh, recommendation, important recommendation in that, uh, in this part of our, our, our recommended reforms is a, a public interest balancing test that we'd like to see added to the foreseeable harm standard. Uh, and that's really come out of, uh, again, A, since, since the 2016 uh, FOIA Improvement Act, 
the way we have seen the foreseeable harm standard uh, implemented and uh, a real feeling on, on the part of civil society that, you know, that's, that's not necessarily being implemented in the way that uh, Congress intended um, or, and in a way that favors disclosure and that there's some ambiguity there. And so we think adding a public interest balancing test would, would clarify uh, and, and help to, to enhance uh, disclosure and FOIA process. Uh, the next piece on, on minimizing delays and improving efficiency, uh, the, the first recommendation in this section is to provide FOIA officers uh, direct access to uh, electronic record systems. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's something this committee has uh, discussed in past sessions. Um, and requiring agencies to proactively disclose certain categories of records. And I know that that is a previous recommendation uh, of one session of this committee. And, and this uh, recommendation actually uh, was based heavily on that recommendation uh, from the FOIA Advisory Committee, uh, categories of records, um, such as you know, agency head calendars, visitor logs, uh, the 10 largest contracts and, and grants, things like that, that would uh, help to remove some of those frequently requested uh, documents from the FOIA stream uh, and hopefully uh, improve the, the efficiency of the process. Finally, uh, the, the, the piece on protecting and strengthening fiscal and corporate transparency. Um, uh, this is the, the piece where, where we have a recommendation related to the B4 exemption that, that is a response to uh, the Argus Leader Supreme Court decision, and, and I know Freddie is going to discuss that in more detail. And uh, we also have a recommendation to apply uh, FOIA to the records of, of private prison and detention centers um, related to their federal government contracts. This is something that you know, would certainly be an uphill battle uh, in terms of, of FOIA legislation and, and getting it, uh, you know, uh, through through uh, the Senate in particular. But it's something that Open the Government uh, feels really strongly about. We, we feel that uh, applying FOIA to private contractors is really the next frontier of FOIA, and it's something that we're really committed to working towards um, in, in the long term, uh, you know, at this point, uh, something like 40% of, of federal government work is, is done by uh, private contractors. And so if FOIA does not apply to 40% of government work, then uh, that's, you know, that's a significant weakness in the law. And so that, that's a real priority for, of ours. And one other piece that I did want to mention, it's not actually one part of these main kind of thematic areas, but I know that, that one subcommittee uh, um, is, is on this committee is considering uh, reforms or recommendations related to OGIS. So uh, I did want to mention that we do have one recommendation as well that would give OGIS the authority to release records as a part of this. So that's, that's kind of a, a brief overview of the, the recommended reforms that we've put forward. Um, and I think uh, now I'll turn it over to Freddie to dive into a little more detail, but then we're happy to uh, take any questions or hear your thoughts and feedback and, and have a discussion after that point. So uh, Freddie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I'm sorry, this is Tuan Samahan. I can't hear any audio. Uh, Tuan, you're not the only one. Freddie, yeah, we can't hear you. He is retooling. Please stand by.
everybody, please do unmute your phone. All right, Freddie, we may have to have you dial back in because we cannot hear you. So stand by while Freddie dials back in, everyone. I can go ahead and, and talk a little bit more about uh, the appropriations piece of, of our recommendations while, while we wait for Freddie uh, to dial back in. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think one thing we did just want to uh, highlight for this committee in particular, and I know it's, it's not an unfamiliar issue to you all, but, um, you know, in, in our kind of, uh, our, our hope to, to uh, you know, advocate for increased resources for FOIA offices, um, it, it's been extremely difficult to get a real sense of uh, the, the budgeting and resourcing needs of, of FOIA offices uh, across the board in any kind of specific terms. Um, and, you know, this is a situation where we actually have uh, folks on the Hill who are interested in this and who are interested in making this happen. Um, but, you know, we find ourselves in a situation where, again, coming by those numbers in any detail is so difficult that, you know, we may find ourselves once again in a position of, of having folks on the Hill have to ask for more information, um, you know, for, for those kind of specific numbers rather than being able to actually, uh, you know, pass some, some, some serious uh, appropriations provisions that would provide some much needed resources. So just an, an ongoing issue that we're finding in our, our attempts to make that happen um, is just coming up with those specific numbers, especially on an agency by agency uh, basis on staffing and resourcing needs. Freddie, is, are, you, are you back now? Uh, no, he's not quite back in. He is still going in. While Freddie is trying to dial back in, can I just uh, pause, Emily, and, and give the committee members an opportunity to ask questions about the legislative proposal so far? Thanks. Sure. Uh, Jason, go ahead. Hi, Elena. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, Emily. So Jason Gart, History Associates Incorporated. Um, can you talk a little bit, of, a bit more about um, your comment about applying FOIA to government contractors and how that would work? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a really, it's a really thorny and really complicated issue, and there are, there would be a lot of, of both, not only you know FOIA and access issues, but but records management issues um, that would come into play there, and and we certainly recognize that. You know, it's it's, it's it would be a long road, and, and we we definitely recognize that. Um, but you know, we we think we we have to get started uh, somewhere, and. Uh, the private prisons and private detention centers industry in particular um, is, was a good place for us to start and to focus because this is something that, that most folks on both sides of the aisle see as, as a, a pretty core government function um, and therefore, you know, a, a good industry to start in terms of, uh, of a place where the public really, uh, you know, direly needs more access um, to, to records. And the way that we have uh, set that up in our recommendations is just to make clear that the records of the private contractor that are related to fulfilling their government contract would be considered agency records for the purpose of FOIA. So it's not, you know, for example, making the contractor uh, to be considered an agency, which would just you know, bring up uh, all kinds of, of additional records management issues for the entirety of that contractor's operations, even outside of their government contract. But instead, just to say that those records that are related to fulfilling the government contract um, would be uh, considered agency records. Thank you. Uh, and Emily, let me just jump to, can you all hear me now? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and if I could just jump in here, and I think a, one of the reasons we think people should take this proposal seriously is that many states already require this, 
And this is also a built into many um, contracts now that, that the records maintained by the contractor are considered agency records um, and are property essentially of the agency. Um, and so if you look across the, so, so that's the first part. The second part is that if you look across the, the country, many states um, really do require that core governmental functions um, be treated uh, as agency records and, and subject to FOIA, um, even if it's done by a private party. Um, so, so for example, Illinois is, is an example here, um, but it's not the only one. It's, it's something like the majority of the states have some version of this. So what we really think is important here is catching up federal FOIA to some of the best practices that are performed um, across the country at the local level. Um, and so, so we definitely think that this is um, an issue that uh, it, it's really more about sort of bringing federal FOIA in line with, some, with other practices across the country. Um, and, and I'm sorry I had to rejoin, so if, if I'm restating this here, uh, just to circle back with um, Emily really quickly. Um, you know, I, I think uh, having an uh, appropriations for things like e-discovery, for like records management, things that I know that the, rec that the FOIA Advisory Committee had discussed before, um, we, we think that that's a great way of tackling some of these issues that it's still technically legislation, but it's also not, um, you know, it doesn't have to touch the text of FOIA. Um, and so, so that's a great place where we think additional resources could be had. Um, in particular, we think that there should be a mechanism by which either the chief FOIA officer or someone in consultation with the chief FOIA officer, maybe the, the CIO, um, should be able to put together joint proposals um, for things like uh, a modernization uh, budget. Um, so maybe they could put together a, a package that says we need money for something like e discovery tools and we're going to use it for both FOIA, um, but in general, um, also record uh, management and other kinds of things. Um, um, sorry, and I'm just kind of going to move um, back on to the, uh, the other idea of the public interest balancing test. Um, and, and that really is just sort of coming out of the fact that uh, the foreseeable harm standard really hasn't been implemented in any, in, in a significant way. And we sort of think that there, there should be at least a subset of, of, in, of interest, public interest that should outweigh kind of exemptions. Um, so things like, like a pub, uh, news media interest, uh, protecting the life of individuals, these kinds of things should override you know, the potential um, to, to exempt information. Um, and we think that that one in particular is a really important um, one. Um, the, okay, um, in, uh, some of the other priorities that we have as a coalition include uh, a, a fix to exemption four. This is the, the Argus Leader decision. We, we definitely um, see strong interest in, in things like um, uh, reverting to the National Park Standard that was upended by, by the Argus Leader decision. And we have interest on the Hill in, in legislation. So for example, the, the Open and Responsive Government Act, which is Senate Bill 742 in this current term, uh, attempts to uh, clarify uh, congressional intent with um, before. And, and in particular, we think that there should be a few things, right? We want to re restore the substantial competitive harm that comes out of the um, exemption. Um, we. We also think that records should be maintained um, and, and, and treated as confidential only if they're both actually and customarily kept secret within both the company and within the industry. Um, we are seeing situations now where agencies are withholding records on the basis that they're confidential um, because they sort of defer to uh, private businesses. Um, and just sort of take their word for it without doing any kind of analysis. We saw an example where the Department of Labor um, was saying that injury, workplace injury reports were, were trade secrets um, for the purposes of FOIA uh, because 
even though they're, you know, the agency uh, is required to proactively disclose some of that information, and the and the business is required to post those records um, publicly in their work workplaces. Um, and that's kind of what's happened after the Argus leader decision. So we need some mechanism both to, re to restore this, some, this idea of a substantial competitive harm that uh, would arise from the release of a business's record. And we also need some mechanism for, you know, an analysis of what, um, what is confidential and what is commercial. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the reasons that we think that the Open and Responsive Government Act really does sort of get to uh, the heart of what we're trying to do here. Um, but we, we definitely think that there, uh, the, the, we, we think that that could be really powerful as part of a package. Um, my apologies. The last part that I want to talk about, I guess, is the, the, the improper withholding of information and the expanded um, access to information. So for, for exemption B7F in particular, uh, this, is, this is an exemption that's used uh, the most frequently in government. And we think that over time, the use has sort of expanded far beyond what was intended by Congress. Um, the, in particular, the text of Exemption B7F is that uh, risk to any person that would arise from the release of records um, is, is the basis for withholding. And this sort of uh, definition of any person has expanded from, you know, a very real particular individual um, to sort of very vague and theoretical harm. Um, we think that limiting B7F to um, any, basically we think that this, any person that is identified as a potential person for, for harm should be um, related to an active law enforcement investigation um, that has some specificity to it. Uh, we've seen the government sort of try, and agencies try to use these um, in, in, for example, in one example, we saw that um, uh, uh, potential flooding risk, for example, in the future uh, to some town potentially, uh, these, these kinds of vagueness, uh, vague, vague risks really do not sort of um, get to what I, we think uh, Congress tries to properly protect. Um, And then finally, in sort of um, reducing um, impro improper withholding and over redaction, we also think that um, we need some mechanism uh, for, sorry, let me pause there. Um, sorry about that. Um, I did want to, sorry, let me shift gears here for a second and talk about um, expanded access to electronic records. Uh, and I know this is an issue that the advisory committee has looked at before. Um, one of the recommendations that we are making is that FOIA officials be given sort of direct electronic access to the records that they would ultimately be uh, reading, searching, redacting, and releasing. Um, so this is a provision that just clarifies that FOIA officials should have direct access to the records that they will release. Um, and this is sort of to reduce the uh, situation where a FOIA officer will go to a subject matter expert maybe two or three or four times, ask them to search for records, um, and then ultimately release those records. Obviously, we think that there will be a situation where these individuals will work together um, but if a FOIA officer can sort of maybe do that first level search, um, this will sort of cut back some of the back and forth between them and the subject matter experts. We're seeing this as one of the major inefficiencies in FOIA across the agencies. And we know that in our discussions with FOIA officers that this is a change that they would uh, very much welcome and they would very much, uh, they would very much speed up their workflow. 
Um, so we think that, that was a no-brainer, and we think that that one would have a lot of agency buy-in um, from officials and from, uh, well, the community as well. Um, I think I will wrap it up there. Yeah, I, I'll leave it there for questions. Okay, great, buddy, thanks. I, I know that Kel McClanahan had a question. Kel, over to you. Hi, thanks for that. Uh, Hi, uh, Emily and Freddie and for the rest of y'all. The question I have is going back to something that Emily talked about when she was talking about the uh, private prison issue. And, and I apologize, I'm hoarse because I have a cold today. Was there, in your analysis, did you come up with any reason that an agency could not go ahead without statutory reform and put in a term in a contract that would uh, require the contractor to make their records available to the agency in the instance of a FOIA request? No, Kel, I, that's a great question. They, there's, I, I don't think there's any reason why they can't, and, and many already do. Um, and that, you know, to be quite honest, that's part of our argument um, is that many Many contracts already include such provisions, uh, so it shouldn't be, you know, a major change or a major shift for for many of these contractors. You know, the reason why we'd still like to see it done through the statute is for, you know, the purposes of of uh, the integrity and strength of of the FOIA as a statute, right? That that is something that sh that we feel should apply to to government work across the board, whether that's being done by agencies or federal employees or whether that's being done by contractors. So, you know, we, we'd love to see that change to the statute, but uh, in the meantime, you're absolutely right. There's no reason why agencies can't go ahead and, and include this in, in their contract currently. Hi, this is Juan. I have a question for Emily Mana. Uh, Emily, could you address a, a little bit this proposed uh, foreseeable harm balancing test? I, um, my my um, thought or immediate reaction is, uh, I, yes, I'm sympathetic with the idea of putting teeth into this test. I recall well Michael Bakesha from Judicial Watch advising that this was going to be a toothless test if it was adopted, and nonetheless, that's what Congress went with, and it largely, in many instances, has proved to be toothless. But I'm concerned, uh, I'm concerned that perhaps it is um, going to create a lot of unpredictability, which at the agency level may mean uh, that uh, people will err on the side of uh, overredaction, uh, and then it pushes the decision basically out of the agency and then into the courts so those who have lawyers can uh, litigate these claims. And of course, uh, when you've got a balancing test that's a standard, uh, you know, that's uh, famously subjective, and it tends to then depend very much upon the identity of the adjudicator. And so, say, how U.S. District Court Judge or, you know, Senior District Court Judge, you know, Royce Lambert applies that test is going to look very different than, say, uh, you, you know, a, a much more uh, pro-government uh, judge. And so, I, I'm wondering whether uh, you've given thought to other ways of putting teeth into this foreseeable harm standard? What, what do you consider the unpredictability issue? Sure. Um, I mean, this has been, this has been a, a longstanding priority of, of our coalition to add a public interest balancing test in some form, uh, and we ultimately decided that you know, post-2016 FOIA Improvement Act that adding it to the foreseeable harm standard would be the best way of doing it because we believe that it will add clarity to the foreseeable harm standard. And that, you know, some of the issues you're describing is to a large extent, you know, what we're already seeing in, in the implementation of the foreseeable harm standard that, uh, you know, agencies are already erring on the side of the and that there is ambiguity there. Uh, you know, a lot of litigation over 
over the foreseeable harm standard and that it, it's hope that that adding language would would in, would clarify um, the foreseeable harm standard rather than adding more ambiguity. Um, we have also, we're adding in our language a, a few different examples of public interest for this purpose to, you know, for, for, for reference, uh, which include things like furthering public understanding of the operations or decision making of an agency or government official, facilitating the public's ability to make informed decisions with respect to electoral or democratic processes, investigating any reasonable suspicion of governmental wrongdoing, furthering public health or safety and other relevant public interests. Uh, you know, so, so we're hoping that we can add clarity rather than adding ambiguity, but, you know, of course, at least in the short term, um, you know, I'm sure there will be a lot of litigation over, over this as there would be over any kind of new change of the FOIA, but it's our hope that down the road in the long term, this improves, ultimately improves disclosure and, and, uh, you know, would, would decrease, would it decrease litigation in the long term. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't have, you know, specifics on, on kind of other other ideas that folks have talked around on adding adding teeth to, you know, foreseeable harm, um, but, but that's kind of a little more insight into our thinking. Uh, and I don't know, Freddie, if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, I, I definitely also want to, I mean, I guess, remind people that there are already balancing tests in the other part of the FOIA. And agency officials and district courts already know how to, you know, deal with them. And so our, our belief is that um, there already is this, I guess, uh, you know, muscle that they can flex um, if they need to. Uh, so, so we have heard that, ra that concern raised, but, but we also just remind people that this is a thing that um, is already in other parts of FOIA, and, and we don't, uh, foresee it sort of add, adding more complexity, um, or at least we, we think that people will be able to handle it um, just fine. Well, so if I could just push back a little bit, uh, you know, every time you write in ambiguity to the statute, you are increasing the cost to claimants and to the government to resolve those ambiguities. And when you've got a fee-shifting statute and you have requesters who, uh, you know, by and large, depend on the goodwill of, you know, uh, pro bono, low bono lawyers, or those who are willing to work on a contingency fee basis, you, you create uh, certain pockets of, of, um, of cost for, uh, you know, prospective clients. And so let me suggest that, you know, a standard's fine, but adding new standards, you, you, also, uh, you can find some bright line rules also to help uh, backstop some of these things. Uh, because, and again, this isn't just, uh, you know, the requester side. I would think, too, if I were a, an, a FOIA officer, uh, you, you know, I would uh, prefer to have some predictability uh, here. Uh, and again, uh, you know, there's a big literature on the uh, costs and drawbacks of standards versus rules. Uh, and, you know, one of the famous ones for standards is, is going to be this unpredictability of costs uh, and, uh, you know, a risk of uh, inconsistent uh, outcomes uh, throughout. And so, again, I, I think that your, your instinct of including some examples is a good start, uh, but I wonder also, are, are there some clear lines maybe that you might draw and, uh, again, make this a little bit more administratively simple for the agencies on the agency side and a little bit easier, less subjective uh, for, uh, you know, the benefit of both uh, counsel and courts. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely something important to consider. Um, you know, again, I'll just say that ultimately, um, you know, it's our belief that that increased disclosure will will ultimately reduce that burden. But but I do agree that you know, in the short term, um, you know, there likely will be a slightly increased burden when when this change is still new. But but it is our hope that that there will be, you know, a kind of result standard ultimately. Um, but, but, you know, absolutely hear your point and thank you for the feedback and, and we, sh we can certainly consider whether there are, you know, a, as you said, more bright kind of bright line um, rules that can be implemented to this as well. 
Hi, this is James Stoker, Trinity Washington University. I also had a question about the foreseeable harm standard. Um, and actually, there are two things that I wanted to ask. First, um, have you all uh, done a study of the role of uh, public interest in uh, foreseeable harm um, determinations? Uh, because I think that my understanding is that uh, agencies have the discretion right now to consider public interest in determining whether something meets the foreseeable harm standard or not, or are you aware of any? And then the other question is, um, on who would the burden be to articulate what the public interest is? Would it be requesters who would have to, uh, in their FOIA request, state what they think the public interest is, or would you just ask the agencies to make a determination about what they think the public interest of a particular request might or might not be? Thank you. Uh, to your first question, we we have not studied that. Freddie, I don't know if you're aware of anything, um, you know, on that note. Uh, to your second question, um, uh, it would it would be to the agency to to weigh that public interest, uh, not not to the pressure, which is why we've you know provided examples in in our recommended language. Uh, Freddie, do you want to say more? Sorry, just muting on the entire time. Um, I definitely agree with you on the on the second part that we we definitely think it should be on the agencies um, to be considering all of these, um, uh, especially with how you know. I, I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is is find a mechanism to make it clear that the public interest in disclosure should override. Um, agency interest and withholding, and what we're adding is, is another sort of additional power to that backing. And so uh, we think that that would sort of make it clear to the agencies uh, that they should be considering all of these things um, when when they're applying exemptions. So, so definitely we think that it's appropriate to um, sort of put that toward the agencies because it's ultimately um, their, the agency's overuse of redactions and exemptions that we're trying to tackle. And the agencies are already the, considering the, the foreseeable harm piece of that. So that's already, that's already required to be part of the agency calculus in deciding whether to withhold information. So this just adds, uh, you know, not only that disclosure would harm an interest protected by an exemption, but and that such harm outweighs the public interest in access to the information. So it's just adding additional language to what the agency is already considering in the foreseeable harm standard. Hi, this is Kel McClendon again. Coming back to this issue, how how would you propose? Specifying in in the rules in the legislation, if if there were to be legislation on this, that you know the public interest could not basically be defeated by the existence of the exemption. Like say that the agency wants to withhold something under B five as attorney-client privilege, and they say, well, there's no public interest in the release of attorney-client privilege information because of the importance of the attorney-client privilege in American jurisprudence or something like that, like they have tried in some of the various foreseeable harm cases where they basically make it a nullity. How would you get around that proactively so that we don't end up back here four years from now re-arguing how, how to make it better yet again? That's, that's a good question, Cal, uh, and, and one that I might leave to the litigators. I'm not a litigator uh, on FOIA. Um, Freddie, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I, I, I don't. I mean, um, yeah, it, it, there's just kind of a circular pattern here, I think, um, which, is, which is challenging. I, I, um, I, I don't have thoughts on that, um, unfortunately. I, I do think that it's... Um, one that we're going to have to tackle as moving forward, but but I don't know how to get to that. Well, if anyone else has any questions, um, now is the time to get them in. We're running a little behind schedule, so uh, I encourage everyone to 
uh, just uh, think through any other questions to ask Emily and Freddie quickly. Um, I'm sure Emily and Freddie will also be available afterwards um, if anyone has any other questions to uh, send them an email. We can reach out to you. Um, there was one comment that we received that I just want to read out loud. Uh, there may be value. Uh, this is to the appropriations issue, Freddie, that you talked about earlier. There may be value in rechanneling FOIA fees towards OJA, which could help provide a secure and additional source of funding. Um, Michael Morrissey is studying fees, so that's something I guess you could take into account as the process subcommittee is talking about that. Anyone else have any questions? Juan, you asked a very good question. I, I don't want to bypass you. Would you like to just ask it out loud? Do you want me to ask it? I lost it in the chat. Uh, I can uh, just leave it for Emily and Freddie to take a look at. I, I was just asking in other contexts, uh, you know, the public interest is uh, limited to knowing what the government is up to. And, and so I, again, wanted to understand better uh, this proposal of, of having public interest uh, uh, considered and, and whether you were proposing a conception of public interest that, that was broader. Uh, again, I, I think uh, public interest can mean is one of these elastic terms that could mean a lot of things, but under the court's jurisprudence, it's been uh, relatively uh, limited when we're, for example, in a privacy context, considering a, uh, you know, uh, B7C uh, redaction, for example. Alina, could I just give like a, a 30 second? answer yeah okay I think I, that's a really great question um, and and something you know to to think about again you know I think specifically for for our litigators and those who will be litigating on this but um, I'll just say that I don't think what we've proposed here is necessarily a broader conception than that I think we've just tried to you know list examples within uh, within kind of what what the government is up to that, um, you know, we think get at some areas where agencies might be, be tempted to to withhold information and, and think that, you know, and, and agency interest might outweigh uh, the public interest there. So I think I think we're just trying to specify further rather than broaden that definition, but, it, but it's, a, it's a great point and definitely something for us to, to consider. All right, great. Anyone else have any burning question that uh, they want to ask Emily or Freddie? All right, I'm not seeing any verbal cues. No one's jumping up and down or anything. So with that, Emily and Freddie, thank you so much uh, for your time. Great presentation, uh, lots to think about, and lots for the subcommittees to take under consideration. Thank you, Alexis, for the clap. Uh, we would be clapping for you if we were live, so we could certainly do that. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome to stick around, Emily and Freddie, for the uh, rest of our discussion. We're actually going to launch into the legislation subcommittee. They are advancing a recommendation today. Perhaps you have comments or questions, so feel free to stick around. Okay, um, everyone strap in. We're ready. We're gonna move on to our subcommittee report. Uh, as a reminder, we've got four subcommittees, but today we're giving more floor time to the legislation subcommittee because they do have a recommendation to move forward. Um, I want to point out to everyone, we have posted mission statements for all four of our subcommittees, classification, legislation, technology, and process. They're all available on the uh, main OTIS webpage. Just scroll down to what's new. A particular note, um, and you will hear perhaps a little bit later this morning, the Technology Subcommittee has tweaked its mission statement, um, kind of redirected itself, so that's great. But first on the agenda today is the Legislation Subcommittee. Um, we have asked this subcommittee to present first, um, since they do have this recommendation. I am going to turn it over to co-chairs Patricia West and Kel McClanahan, but Patricia will speak today since Kel is a little under the weather. Um, so, Patricia, you're going to go ahead and give us an update on what your subcommittee has been doing. Okay. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, for the legislation subcommittee, we have a number of working groups. 
And today we're going to report out on three of them. And I'm actually going to turn it over to the leads of each working group. So um, you'll be hearing from Alan Blatstein, who is the lead for the FOIA fees working group. Uh, and then next, uh, Matthew Schwartz will give a report out on the FOIA funding working group. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, is going to be Tom Sussman, who leads the Expanding the Scope of FOIA Working Group. Um, the majority of our time is going to be going to Tom because uh, he has a recommendation uh, to propose to the full committee. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alan. Thank you. One new FOIA idea we have recently explored uh, in conjunction with the process subcommittee is whether ordinary requesters should receive additional free search time and whether commercial requesters should receive limited free services as well. One agency that has already enacted these changes is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which in 2018 amended its FOIA regulations and waived search fees and review fees up to $250. Uh, we spoke with the CFPB FOIA staff and they stated that overall their regulatory change has increased the efficiency of their operations. Whether other agencies would enjoy similar benefits is unclear. It is also unclear whether other agencies or Congress would support reducing fees for commercial requesters. So our deliberations on this issue will continue. That's all from the fee working group. Thanks, Alan. Hi, this is and Matthew. Patricia, I think you're on mute. No, now she's okay. Oh, I'm on mute? No, you're good. You're good. Oh, you're okay. good now. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so Matthew will then um, report out on the FOIA funded working group. Yeah, thanks, Patricia. Um, this is Matt Schwartz. So for the funding working group, uh, Kimberly Reedwood Nara did some wonderful research for us, um, and she combed through the appropriations bills and found some interesting line items. Um, and so I was interested to hear. Um, when Freddie was talking about possible line items and appropriations bills, so I think we'll look into that as well. Um, I plan to do some additional research to see what both states and other countries are doing in terms of funding their, um, their sunshine law. Um, additionally, I thought the, the comment today um, in rechanneling FOIA fees through OGIS is very interesting, so I want to do some research into that as well. So I have that on my plate moving forward. Thanks. And with that, we're going to turn the remainder of our time over to Tom Sussman. So, Tom, take it away, please. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Uh, you've all been circulated a draft, uh, a preliminary uh, draft of uh, a paper that I wrote that forms the basis of the subcommittee's recommendation. Um, I've gotten very good feedback from Matt and uh, Patricia that ha has not yet been incorporated, but I do want to start by inviting everyone to um, please feel free to get hold of me directly with any uh, suggestions, criticisms, editorial comments, because I will be uh, revising this. Um, and uh, the title should more accurately address uh, access to the legislative branch rather than uh, Congress because it goes beyond the actual Congress itself, as, as you've read. Uh, special thanks to a few people, Daniel Schumann, who addressed this committee at our last meeting, uh, really did groundbreaking work in this area, and uh, I cite to him and rely on his work quite a bit. Uh, both Alex Howard and James Valvo uh, have uh, uh, done research and produced papers and been active uh, in this field, and uh, I also rely on their work. Uh, the subcommittee's focus responded to a recommendation of, last, uh, of the last 
advisory committee that um, the, its successor should look at application to the legislative and judicial branches. Um, this is part one on the legislative branch and uh, uh, no commitments yet in terms of uh, what will follow. Um, I'll hit the highlights of the recommendation, which I think will be put on the screen. Um, and, um, and then we will discuss, uh, take questions and have discussion. Uh, the the uh, subcommittee decided that, um, uh, you know, we're at a point where the committee may want to go ahead and approve a, inter a recommendation that can go to the archivist and move through channels without waiting until the end of the full committee term. Uh, or you can postpone consideration, uh, whatever, however the, the committee decides to do that. Uh, can we get the recommendation language up there, Kirsten? Um, there yes, there it is. Thank Perfect. you, Michelle. Oh, thank you, Michelle, right. Uh, we start out with the, the proposal that the procedures uh, for access should be um, uh, directed towards uh, the support uh, offices and agencies of Congress uh, and not broadly at Congress. Those are listed in the paper, Capitol Police, GAO, Library of Congress, CBO, and others. They all perform administrative and support functions similar to the kind of functions provided by executive agencies. Uh, some already have uh, formal FOIA processes like the uh, governmental accountability office uh, that has adopted regulations. Uh, some have informal ones, uh, like the uh, Congressional Budget Office. Uh, others, like the Capitol Police, uh, remain uh, closed and opaque. Uh, the recommendation does not apply to members' offices, uh, committees. Um, uh, the, um, the reasons are really spelled out in the draft paper, political, practical, and constitutional. Um, I, there, there, there is likely to be some disagreement on that subject, uh, and I'm not sure that any one reason can be uh, identified as determinative. Um, I have to admit that uh, with uh, I've had a, over 50 years in and around the legislative branch, and a lot of this is my own sort of strategic conclusion that uh, not approaching Congress head on um, where members would worry about how does this affect me and my office and my staff and my committees uh, is a more likely way to get serious consideration. Uh, we talk about access procedures modeled after uh, those in the Freedom of Information Act, not application of the FOIA itself. Uh, full acknowledgement that many states and foreign countries uh, have right to know laws, access to information, statutes, and regulations that apply to their parliaments and their legislative branches, as well as the executives. Uh, again, this was, I think, more of a strategic decision that um, Congress is, is different it considers itself different, and it's more likely to be responsive to wanting to craft uh, rules from the beginning that applies to apply to itself, rather than um, try to figure out how to carve out exceptions or you know, B3 statutes or whatever it might do uh, when it began to take uh, a red pen to the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, proactive disclosure is specifically mentioned. Congress does an awful lot of that right now. A uh, number of areas where it already puts information up on the web, and um, uh, that's certainly appreciated by the public and media and everybody who follows legislation. Um, we've identified a few areas, some proposed by Daniel Schumann, others recommended by uh, uh, some others who've uh, looked into this. Uh, and it's an open, that's an open list. I'm sure there are others, and I would invite suggestions of what we should add as four examples. Uh, the 
proposal that uh, uh, whatever Congress adopts, whether it's uh, uh, regulate rules or legislation, that it include um, procedures governing the requests and time limits. Uh, again, uh, the FOIA provides a model, but uh, I was hesitant to suggest that the advisory committee would uh, attempt to uh, proscribe, uh, prescribe de uh, details for Congress, uh, dictate what they should adopt, uh, but uh, uh, to use the FOIA as a model as the Government Accountability Office has, uh, and um, allowing Congress to make the last, uh, the final decision. Uh, we stop short of proposing judicial review of final agency decisions to withhold. Uh, there are potential constitutional concerns, um, and uh, I, I go back to uh, probably even greater than constitutional are the practical and political challenges of Congress, asking Congress to subject itself to uh, a, another branch's uh, routine review. I'm not saying that the you know, courts uh, have hands off when it comes to legislative decision making. That goes back to Marbury versus Madison. Uh, but to have uh, uh, Congress place itself in a position where uh, every time a denial uh, of information uh, is made, uh, that a requester <clears throat> could go immediately to court to challenge Congress, I think that uh, that would uh, not likely uh, uh, be a workable solution. Uh, more likely to have an independent office within the legislative branch uh, that is uh, uh, led by members of Congress who are ultimately responsible uh, to make the appeal decisions. Okay, that, this won't be the first time a recommendation uh, it has been made to Congress to apply FOIA or some similar law to itself. It's considered and had hearings on this subject before. Uh, the fact that uh, there has been zero movement on this issue ever uh, suggests that um, uh, this may not be the last recommendation of its sort. Um, I know it doesn't go far enough for some who might think that uh, uh, FOIA should apply to the legislative branch just as it applies to the executive branch. Uh, I've called this the what's good for the goose principle. Um, but uh, uh, I think that uh, however principled that approach is, um, it is not likely to go under serious consideration by the first branch and so our subcommittee decided to recommend a more modest uh, step, though uh, I believe a strategic one. So that's the description and background, and I'd be pleased to uh, participate with my uh, subcommittee members in uh, discussing and responding to questions, and obviously the uh, recommendation is on the screen to invite uh, suggestions and its uh, proposals for uh, improvement. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tom. Really appreciate that. Um, I know that we had a robust discussion at the subcommittee level, uh, but at this point, I want to invite um, any other committee member who is not on the legislation subcommittee to provide any comments, questions, or feedback. So I'm going to open up the floor to that. Um, and after we have finished deliberating, uh, but before we take a vote on the recommendation, which is what I assume we're trying to do today, correct, Tom? Correct, Patricia? Correct, Kel? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes. We will open up our telephone lines to welcome any public comments so we can hear from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share on this particular recommendation. So with that, I'm gonna open up the floor to other committee members. Anyone have anything they'd like to talk about? This is Kel. I just wanted to add one point of clarification before it gets too muddy in the discussion. Uh, when Tom had mentioned that we, we stayed, we steered clear of recommending judicial review, or, or, or and thought about, well, maybe it should be an independent office or an independent panel or something like that. We steered clear of making any particular recommendation in general. 
and we actually had a fairly robust discussion on this and decided in the end that we would not foreclose it either. And if, you know, if Tom happens to be incorrect about the, the pallet in uh, Congress right now, and Congress is okay with judicial review, great. You know, we're, we do not want to put our thumb on the scale one way or the other. Just we, our, our design here was to uh, say it, there needs to be some kind of review. You know, there needs to be something, uh, some kind of access and some kind of sort of appellate authority uh, to look at these things. How we're not going to micromanage, we're not going to prescribe actual uh, ways this could happen, although we would obviously be welcome to share our analysis with anyone who wanted to start working on legislation like this. But that shouldn't be read as an, an endorsement or a lack of endorsement of any particular provision. Okay, thanks, Cal. Hi, this is Twan. I just had sure. this is Sorry. Twan. I just had a quick question. Is the constitutional concern you alluded to the speech or debate clause? Is that the specific issue that was having you pull back from judicial review? Um, yeah, they're actually uh, uh, that's that's the main one. Uh, I, I should mention also that uh, uh, only last week the D.C. Circuit came out with a decision. Um, because James Valvo uh, sued Congress uh, under the common law right of access uh, to get access uh, to information from the House Intelligence Committee. And um, I confess I hadn't even thought of or approached that issue, but the court also discusses the speech and debate clause and all, and I think probably interprets it broader, more broadly than I would have. So um, I think that there needs to, I think it needs to probably be given a little more attention in terms of the report, but uh, there also, uh, these issues were discussed in greater detail uh, in the O'Reilly article of a, a number of years ago that, uh, that cited, uh, and, uh, and there are other, he, he, he goes through a discussion, a very erudite and academic discussion that I didn't repeat of, of other potential separation of powers and presentment and things of that sort that might implicate constitutional arguments. And for instance, there was just the case of um, Eric Swallow attempting to serve Mo Brooks and the court said, I'm not gonna order U.S. Marshal to deliver the subpoena because it might, or to deliver the summons because it might implicate some kind of separation of power. So this, it's more of a nebulous concept uh, than just feature debate, but yes, feature debate is definitely one of the key concerns here. This is James Stoker from Trinity Washington University. Uh, first, uh, I just want to thank everyone on the subcommittee for all, for all their work on this. I think this is a this is a great recommendation or draft recommendation. Uh, my question is about uh, the exemptions. Um, what exemptions do you think um, would a law on congressional transparency include? Would they be the same as the FOIA? I'm thinking, for instance, of the Office of Congressional um, Ethics, right, which uh, will which is, which is an office that uh, many members of Congress and then also staff members will turn to to ask uh, whether or not they are allowed to do something or other, to hold a meeting or to attend a lunch or, or, or whatever else. And um, they have an expectation when they inquire of this office uh, to, uh, to a, a relatively great deal of privacy and they need to, need to be able to, to ask questions in order to um, yep, to, to effectively do their, do their job so they know that what they are allowed to do and what they're not. And so it seems to me that that would be an example of a case where uh, the Congress will want to ensure that they are erring on the side of, um, uh, of protecting the privacy interests of, of individuals. And so I guess I'm just wondering whether um, Congress is going to need whole new categories of exemptions or if the ones that are already in the FOIA are, are enough. 
Yeah, this is Tom Sussman, uh, and uh, let me take a shot at that. I, you know, a, a lot of these questions can be answered by saying, is there an executive agency counterpart that does that sort of thing? And if so, are the exemptions adequate? Uh, there was a question in the chat about the Capitol Police. Would this apply to Capitol Police? The answer is, you know, uh, it applies to uh, the Secret Service. It applies to the FBI. The, uh, the D.C. FOIA applies to the D.C. police. We have lots of uh, uh, examples across the country where police forces uh, are, are under every state's freedom of information law. So that's the answer I would give. With ethics opinions, uh, the same thing. We have uh, every a, every agency and department has an ethics officer that gives opinions to government employees who come and ask, can I go to this reception or can I accept this gift? Or the uh, Office of Government Ethics that answers, uh, you know, what, what do I need to divest in order not to have a conflict of interest? All of that's been protected. I, we haven't seen any uh, agitation for expanding exemptions to protect privacy uh, in those areas. Uh, so I would think that, as I said before, I think the FOIA exemptions have been tried and true in many ways uh, uh, with years of, uh, alleged, of uh, I'm sorry, judicial interpretation. Uh, and so I would kind of hate to see Congress start from scratch, uh, especially since uh, there wouldn't be the same opportunity for uh, judicial interpretation of the language. And I wouldn't trust Congress to use extremely precise language the first time through. So. <laughs> I, I feel comfortable with the, the, starting with the current exemptions. And th this is Kel. I, I can sort of add some uh, both more generality and more specificity to that statement. The, the first, the general statement is, you know, we did a lot of thinking in this. And when it boils down to it, I mean, one, one of the complaints that people often hear about FOIA that is a fair complaint is that the exemptions – even though they're supposed to be read narrowly, can be read very broadly, especially V5. And if you look at that, it's really hard to think of a type of information that, uh, let's say, at the GAO or at the Capitol Police, that would not be covered by uh, – an, ex an existing exemption that would need to be covered by something. And so, you know, I think this might be a, uh, a solution in search of a problem. Uh, as for specifics, you know, there, there's already precedent for this idea of just importing FOIA. You know, this is how uh, the Western Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Met Metro, WMATA, WMATA have their own FOIA procedure. They are not subject to federal FOIA, but they have this thing called the PARP, the Public Access to Records Policy. And in its text, PARP says we follow FOIA and we follow judicial interpretations of FOIA. And so if a case comes down that says that B-5 means something or that this type of information is exempt from the B-3, then it's also exempt under PARP. By the same token, if it's not exempt, it's not exempt. And so, you know, you have the, you already have this other entity that is not an executive branch agency that has a tried and true history of just saying, yeah, boy, it's pretty broad enough for us. You know, there's nothing really new that we need to create here. Uh, this is Kristen Ellis from the FBI. I to piggyback off that a little bit, if you're looking at agencies like the Capitol Police um, or GAO, a lot of information that they have could have originated from the executive branch. Um, certainly, as a law enforcement agency sharing information with the Capitol Police and vice versa, um, GAO obviously would have copious quantities of, of executive branch records. and. Parity is key in being able to protect the executive branch records. Um, we see this with state and local law enforcement agencies a lot when FBI information is shared. 
every state has its own protections. And so it, ensuring that the information is properly treated becomes difficult under 50 different statutes. So uh, I would, you know, to the extent that this gets any traction, I, I agree that I think the exemptions that exist have worked since they were enacted and it, it would make sense for them to be adopted. And obviously if there is a particular type of information that's not reflected in executive branch records that Congress thinks it needs to protect, you know, it certainly could add things. Um, but I think the ones that already exist would make sense just given the nature of the sharing of information, at least with some of the agencies. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Uh, Jason, I know, has a question. He's been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Uh, Jason Gart, History Associates Incorporated. So um, this is very, very interesting. I wonder, as, as, as you were crafting this, um, if you reached out to the Advisory Committee on Records of Congress, um, which I believe also David Ferriero is a part of, to just see, you know, what what their stream of thinking is and what they're doing on this issue. And it may not be something that, that they're dealing with, but, you know, you do, as, as your starting point, talk about the political considerations. And, and I just wonder, you know, um, what, what if, if you reached out to that committee and, and if, if they have thoughts on it. But Tom Sussman responding, no, I haven't. It's a good idea. Um, I, I, we did get some comments about uh, record keeping and record management. Uh, Jason Barron on the previous committee, uh, advisory committee, filed the uh, uh, comments that uh, I think are, have been posted. And uh, Daniel Schumann, uh, who I see uh, active in the chat, um, uh, has, uh, has also spent some time looking at uh, the archives, management, access to committee records, et cetera. Uh, I, that's, a, that's a major subject, uh, an important one. I think, you know, it's, it, it'd be good to, to uh, get the view of the advisory committee, but uh, for now we're looking at access, um, uh, FOIA or FOIA-like access, and I'm going to leave to somebody else uh, the, uh, uh, the plumbing of uh, records, retention records, management, and uh, archive records access uh, from the legislative branch, an important subject indeed. Okay. Uh, anyone else from the committee have any questions? I know we've gotten some chat comments. We, I was just going to read them out loud, uh, but before I... I do that. I wanted to give uh, any other committee members a chance to ask questions or make comments. Everyone's good? Everyone's probably ready for a break. Okay. Hi, this is James Stoker again. I, I, I'm sorry, I had, uh, had one other, other question I wanted to ask. And uh, basically it's that uh, who would be the ultimate arbiter of this legislation within the Congress? In other words, uh, you know, who would be making the decisions about whether uh, to grant or not uh, grant responses to, to requests? Um, I ask this question because one obvious concern about this would be the potential for political misuse. And um, you mentioned earlier that there was, you know, there are parallels in the executive branch for all sorts of situations, and certainly that's the case in the executive branch as well. Uh, someone who's in charge of FOIA could potentially uh, misuse the FOIA or use it in a political manner. But it seems to me that the stakes are even greater in the Congress. Um, and we can imagine if a, a very partisan actor was in charge of deciding whether or not to respond to transparency requests, that it could be used in quite a damaging way or in a way that disrupts the functioning of the Congress. So how could uh, concerns about that possibility be addressed? Thank you. James, this is Tom Sussman. I can't believe you're suggesting that Congress might be political. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know that there's ever a guard against political misuse. Certainly, as you as you acknowledge, uh, it happens in the executive branch. Of course, there you can go to court. That is an argument for getting it out of the branch. Um, uh, 
it, the, the, we suggest alternatives that would include um, the involvement of members of Congress in the ultimate decision making so that the Capitol Police General Counsel could make the initial decision of a request to the Capitol Police uh, uh, Force. Um, and if uh, uh, a requester wanted to appeal, um, uh, they would go to, and what again, I, I'd love like to see if I were doing the drafting, uh, an independent entity in the legislative branch that is um, headed by members of Congress. Uh, and you know, I, I, I don't like to use examples because most of the ones, the joint ones like the uh, Joint Committee on uh, Publishing is sort of moribund. Uh, but you know, I could sort of, I could foresee a, a Joint Congressional Committee on Information um, that could, you know, take care of a lot of these records management and archiving. There's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, consistency, uniformity between the two houses of Congress uh, uh, on a lot of these issues that, that really would benefit from some management. Um, so um, I, I don't have a clear answer, and I clearly, whatever answer one gives. If it's in the hands of a member of Congress, uh, uh, it is going. There's likely to be some political uh, consideration given, and I don't know that one could avoid that. I, I think we're recently um, confronted with the fact that even on judicial review, uh, we're uh, looking at some what some might call political influence of decision making. Um, that's inherent in our system, I'm afraid. And, and this is, Kel, I can sort of hit the other side of that coin, which is, you know, some some may raise the concern that, you know, what if this is used for political uh, purposes to, you know, get information out, you know, not to uh, withhold information for political gain, but to release information for political gain. And to that, to that point, it's, Already something they can do. I mean, this this is this is Congress we're talking about, and so you know there is absolutely nothing restricting a random member of Congress from just releasing information they want to release for political gain, except occasionally if it's classified, you know, and even then you have sort of clever ways around that, uh, as you know Mike Gravel discovered a few years back. But, you know, I think that, again, it might be, to, to reuse the same sort of tired phrase, a solution in search of a problem for us to try and guard against an appellate authority of a FOIA-like process not being able to do what any member of Congress can do anyway. Kel, this is Tom Sussman. The, the flip side of that is, and I hadn't, you know, I just thought about it, is when you, when you talk about political use of the FOIA, uh, I can see challengers to members of Congress uh, and senators uh, at election time um, if, if such a law applied to their offices, individuals, or staff. I could see this being weaponized as a campaign tool, uh, much likely so if it's the Library of Congress, the police, or the uh, Government Accountability Office that's subject to uh, uh, access. And, and, and that's a very good point. I think that that sort of underlines the reason that we chose the, the offices we did, because we didn't choose, even to the extent that committees can be found to be beholden to the chair, you know, we only chose agencies that are, you know, independent. You know, they, they, they serve the public. They serve every member of Congress equally. They serve every member of the public equally. The degree to which they serve varies, <laughs> but you know, no one can say that they are going to immediately look out for the best interests of one person or one uh, party over the other. When you when you have a public service mandate like the Library of Congress, like the Government Accountability Office, like the Architect of the Capitol, the Capitol Police, then a public awareness of your activities should also come with that. 
Thanks, Kel. Uh, Jason, you had a follow-up question? Yeah, um, so I, this is where I guess I disagree a little bit. So, and, and first of all, so it, it, to use two of your examples, Library of Congress, it, there, there's not really a public function. It, it serves the members of Congress. It's a library for the members of Congress. You know, um, others can use it, but it's actually, its purpose is, is for members of Congress. I would say the same of, of the Congressional Research um, Service, and, and you have it as Congressional Reference Service, but it, I believe it's Congressional Research Service, where, you know, it's intended to serve uh, it's intended to serve the research needs of members of Congress as part of their internal deliberations. Um, and most of, and you cite as examples that, well, you know, the historical CRS reports, but they are, most of them are publicly available. Um, most of them, you know, are either on the CRS website, uh, there's like 9,000 of them, and then the others are just, are essentially available in various places like congressional, ProQuest Congressional and other databases. So, you know, if you look at, if you say, okay, the CRS stuff, the, the CRS reports are already out there, really. You just need to look for them. And then the other function to serve as a research services for members of Congress, would that improve the functioning of Congress by allowing you to FOIA that information? Well, my response, yeah, good, good questions. This is Tom Sussman, all right. Uh, CRS reports, uh, the ones that CRS doesn't post may well be out there. They may well not be out there. We don't know, but, and they may be out there, and you have to pay to get them. So, um, I mean, I, I, I'd hate to apply that uh, standard to uh, to the executive branch. Uh, you know, it's out there somewhere. You just need to find it. Maybe Westlaw has it. Um, but, well, it's but, a microfiche. There, there, there's, you know, it's in libraries, a microfiche. It's not, it's not totally digitized, but it's available to, to the two-step process of going to a library and pulling indices and, and grabbing it off of microfiche. Uh, on, the subject, on the subject of, um, you know, the, the purpose of CRS is to provide resource to Congress, uh, certainly uh, no member of Congress pays for it out of his or her pocket. It still comes out of tax dollars. And uh, I probably, with the, in, in a very few minutes, could name you at least 50 different executive branch offices uh, whose function is to support executive branch officials and agencies. And they're all subject to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, even though they may not be publicly facing. We don't, we, we don't make that distinction uh, with executive branch, and I wouldn't make that in the legislative branch. And to follow up on that, I, I would sort of push back against the idea that the goal of this is to improve the functioning of Congress. Uh, Congress will function most effectively in complete secrecy, no open hearings, no open meetings, no open records. That will allow them to function very efficiently. So will the executive branch. This isn't about that. This is about allowing the government, um, allowing the people to, as FOIA dictates, know what the government is up to. And the, it, the cases that cite that rule do not say that FOIA is designed to let the people know what the executive branch is up to. So there are a lot of FOIA officers out there and a lot of agencies out there who would say that FOIA makes their job a lot harder and makes, it, makes them function much less efficiently. And we don't accept this from them, and I think that saying, well, then we shouldn't apply it to, you know, CRS or to Capitol Police or to GAO because they serve a similar purpose uh, would be equally misguided. Okay. Um, I'm mindful of our time and don't want to discourage any further questions or comments from any of the committee members. So I'll pause for a second to make sure that everyone has gotten their uh, questions or comments in. Um, I know we've gotten several um, chat comments uh, to all panelists from Daniel Schumann, who was our presenter last time, from, um, uh, to whom Tom referred as a great source of information on this particular recommendation. So. I was going to turn next to Michelle, our event producer, to ask her to open up our telephone line. 
uh, Daniel has offered to summarize his comments. Michelle, can you please go ahead and give instructions on um, presenting any comments at this time through the phone? Absolutely. So, first off, um, Daniel Schumann, if you would like to uh, make your comment, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to open your um, your line. And there you are. All right. So your line is unmuted. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see your smiling faces. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be uh, on video with you all as well, um, but I guess it's an unfair advantage. Um, but thank you all for giving me an opportunity to make a public comment. Uh, there are a couple issues that came up during uh, Tom's eloquent presentation and the great conversation that followed from it that I thought might uh, be useful to clarify. First, uh, inside the legislative branch, we already have FOIA applied to the Copyright Office itself, although no other support offices or agencies, but there are several support offices or agencies that follow a FOIA-like process. Uh, for example, both the Library of Congress and the Government Accountability Office have promulgated regulations, including an appeals process by which you can go and request documents. In addition, uh, Congress directed the Capitol Police at the end of the last Congress uh, to go and implement a FOIA-like process as well. So we are already seeing FOIA-like processes uh, being put into place. They generally follow similar rules that FOIA, that FOIA applies with respect to the support offices and agencies. Uh, we don't know what the Capitol Police's will look like. Um, uh, as someone who's worked sort of with respect to the support offices and agencies, just by way of anecdote, we spent the last three and a half years investigating some of the failings and other problems inside the Capitol Police, which is very difficult to do when there isn't a tool available like FOIA. And one of the values, of course, of having openness and transparency is that you can identify problems and then remedy them before they become acute. And I would suggest that had there been more uh, more insight into the Capitol East, for example, we might have had things go very differently at the beginning of this year. Um, uh, I, I think that there's also just sort of value in thinking, you know, FOIA, of course, is both a proactive and a reactive disclosure provision. Having more proactive disclosure with respect to certain things, um, uh, with respect to the operations of these support offices and agencies, I think would be welcome. Uh, Happy to talk about this more, but I, I'm trying to be brief. The second is I've attended all the meetings of the Advisory Committee on the Records of Congress. Uh, this has not been a matter that has come up before them, at least in the meetings that I attended, although I did miss one, I think, six months ago. Uh, they tend to be more focused on the archival question about what happens to member rec committee records when they retire. It's a number of very, very thoughtful, intelligent folks that are largely historians, uh, so that seems to be their attitude. Um, uh, in their focus. Um, so you could talk to the clerk of the House and Secretary of the Senate to see, to sort of gauge their interest. Their meeting was just this past week. Um, but it has, it has not been something that has, that has come up. The final question I think that was raised was the mechanism of like oversight or appeals. Currently for the, the processes that exist, you can appeal inside the agency. So for example, from the Library of Congress, if they don't respond to a request that you make, you can appeal it internally inside the Library of Congress. Uh, the same thing is true for GAO. Uh, it goes up, I believe it goes up to council. Um, we've had great success. GAO has a very effective appellate process. It works really well. The Library of Congress is not particularly responsive to FOIA requests. You actually have to go and find ways to draw public attention to it before they'll actually respond to you. Uh, but there is an appeals process. And I suspect that there is probably value in harmonizing um, some of the, the FOIA processes across the support offices, extending to the ones that does not currently apply. So instead of doing it piecemeal one at a time, you can rather have a general rule that is sort of understood as applying across uh, the various support offices and agencies. Uh, and then sort of, you know, you have it go to some sort of an appellate process that is inside the legislative branch, so you can avoid some of the conflicts of interest that could potentially exist. Uh, while still making sure that it, that it's you don't run into the separation of powers questions. I know these are, I, I've talked more probably than you guys uh, want to hear, particularly since it's already a lengthy meeting. But I hope that this was helpful in clearing up uh, some of the questions that came up in your conversation. I'm so appreciative that you're thinking through these questions. Designing stuff inside the legislative branch is very hard, and I I am just thrilled that you guys are are thinking about different ways to make uh, our democracy more responsive and accountable. So thank you very much.
Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Really appreciate that. Um, since we have our lines open, Michelle, I'm just going to check to make sure no one else is interested in offering a public comment or asking a question. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if anybody else would like to make a comment or ask a question, please do press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. Okay. We'll just pause for a second. Um, I don't know how would the other committee members feel, but I'm going to speak for myself that I am in need of a comfort break. Um, and we're about 20 minutes behind schedule, so um, I, I do to see, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elena. I do see someone has a question on the line. Okay, go ahead, please. All, all right, Cole, your line is unmuted. Yes, hi, this is uh, Bob Hammond. Can you hear me, please? Yes, Mr. Hammond, um, this is a question or a comment you have about the current recommendation. Uh, yes, it's really a more general comment. The phone line keeps break, breaking up and disconnecting, and I wonder if during the break somebody could take a look at that. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to propose is that we take a break since we're about 20 minutes behind schedule. Uh, when we resume, uh, let's um, uh, move the recommendation forward for a vote, if, if that's acceptable to everyone, and uh, we'll take a vote. I'll go over the voting rules very briefly again, just to remind everyone, since it's the first vote we've had as a committee. And uh, let's, um, let's all come back at 12.05 p.m., if that's at all possible. All right, thanks everyone.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. For those of you who are experiencing any type of audio issues throughout today's event, um, please do feel free to dial back in for the audio for, for the event. So that's just for those of you who have had some kind of audio issue, just feel free to dial back in for the event. With that, I'm going to turn the event back over to Alina Simo. Alina, please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate it. Um, I think almost all of us are back. I'm um, just checking visually to see if we've definitely got a quorum. Um, Allison, AJ, Bobby are not back yet. Um, I'm here. Okay, thanks, Alvin. Uh, Tuan? I'm here. AJ's here as well. Okay, great. You guys are just not necessarily on camera. I'm, I'm here too. I'm just adjusting my computer. Okay. One so here is just uh, getting adjusted. Okay. Everyone's adjusted. This is great. Okay. Um, before we move to um, vote on this recommendation that uh, the legislation subcommittee has moved forward, I just want to give one final sweep to any of the committee members if they have any other questions that we didn't have a chance to get to before the break. All right, silence is golden. Okay, um, I want to go over the voting procedure since this is the first time we're taking a vote as a committee. Uh, briefly, any member of the committee can move to vote on a recommendation. The motion does not need to be seconded, although it seems like we've been doing that for a while, so it's very nice to have it, and I will be happy to entertain one. The vote can pass by unanimous decision, which is when every voting member except abstention is in favor of or opposed to a particular motion. General consensus, which is when at least two thirds of the total votes cast are in favor, favor of or are opposed to a particular motion. And a general majority, which is when a majority of the total votes cast are in favor of or are opposed to a particular motion. In the event of a tie, we will, we will reopen discussion and the committee will continue to vote until there is a majority. If you are in favor of the recommendation, say aye. If you are against the recommendation, say nay. If you do not wish to vote, say abstain. In this current virtual environment, we will take a voice vote. I will make sure we pay particular attention to nays and abstentions. Kirsten, our DFO, will record and announce the results of the vote. So at this time, is anyone prepared to make a motion on this recommendation? I am. Uh, this is, uh. I am, would that help? Yes. Okay. Uh, do I so have a second for that motion? Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. Uh, this is Patricia Webb, I second the motion. Well, there is, there is one small change that we discussed in the chat. This. Uh, this recommendation is taking the brackets out around or enact legislation so that it just becomes part of the sentence. But as amended, I motion, I move that we vote to accept this recommendation. Okay. And Patricia Rath, I second the motion. Okay, Patricia, thank you for the second. Yeah. Um, at this time, does anyone have a question? I thought I heard someone else. No? Okay. Uh, at this time, let's. Let's go ahead and take a vote. All in favor of this recommendation as currently written on the screen, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, anyone not in favor of the recommendation, please say nay. All right. I hear no nays. Uh, is anyone abstaining? Hi, Alina. Just uh, current, consistent with my past voting practice, I'm abstaining. Um, I'm actually also going to abstain, um, and hopefully that's not a surprise to anyone, but I just thought I would explain my rationale. In the event the archivist accepts this recommendation and tasks OGIS to convey the recommendation directly to Congress, I don't want my vote now to give the appearance of a conflict as director of OGIS and chairperson of this committee, so I abstain. Um, so, Kirsten, hopefully you will note that. Would you like to read the vote of the committee then overall, Kirsten? Hello, it's Kirsten. The vote was um, 16 to 0 with two abstentions, um, Alina and Bobby. Okay. So the motion right, carries. Right. Great. So the recommendation is passed. Thank you very much, Legislation Subcommittee. 
We expect great things from you at the next uh, meeting. Perhaps there'll be another recommendation. No pressure on the other subcommittees. Okay, Alina, I have that. A, yes. a, a short question. Because we only had abstentions, but this is still not unanimous because of the abstentions? No, it's still considered unanimous. Well, then on behalf of the committee, or the subcommittee, thank you all for entertaining our ideas, and we'll see what happens next. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move on to the reports of the other three subcommittees. I uh, don't want to um, have anyone feel left out. Uh, second on the agenda is the process subcommittee. Um, I know Linda, I don't think, has joined us. So, Michael Morrissey, as the co-chair, I'm going to turn over to you for any updates. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, yeah, that's a, a tough act to follow, and it's it's really great to see that recommendation moving forward. Um, with the process subcommittee, a lot of our work has continued to be sort of in coordination with a lot of the other subcommittees. So thank you to all the other subcommittees for being so so great and collaborative. Um, we are working on wrapping up a lot of our our work, um, examining sort of the impact of of prior recommendations. Uh, some of that is already kind of going into reports uh, or, or kind of uh, proposals with with other subcommittees, um, but we hope to have some sort of very informal kind of draft report, just mostly for ourselves to kind of think about, okay, here's what's work and, and collect all the thinking and discussions we've had in the past. Um, we're also starting to move towards looking at sort of what are the next round of uh, more forward-looking recommendations using that context to both follow up on some of the successes and, and challenges of prior recommendations, as also looking at sort of what are some of the key process-related areas that have been unaddressed. Um, so not a whole lot of new and exciting proposals to, uh, to discuss today, um, but we've had a lot of really great discussions and, and great collaborations um, going forward and um, hope by the next uh, subcommittee meeting or the advisory committee meeting um, to have some concrete uh, findings that can put forward. Okay, no pressure, Michael. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Anyone else from the process subcommittee want to add anything? Okay. All right, I'm going to next turn on, on our agenda to the technology subcommittee. Uh, Co-chairs Allison Dietrich and Jason Gard. Allison, are you presenting today? I am, thanks, Selena. So uh, first thing, uh, as Lena mentioned in her introductory remarks this morning, shortly after the last full advisory committee meeting, the technology subcommittee regrouped and re revised our mission statement. So it now reads um, that our mission statement is to prepare baseline standards and best practice recommendations to ensure that federal agencies have up-to-date access and impartial information on the functionality and operation of technology-driven solutions to ensure that the selection and implementation of new FOIA tools meet current and future needs of federal agencies and the requester community. And this is, can be found on the technology subcommittee part of the NARA FOIA advisory committee webpage. Um, we spent a lot of time during the last nine months, six months um, since we started meeting, trying to figure out how we can best serve the FOIA community, both requesters and agencies. And this involved a lot of discussions with agency representatives to determine the types of technology recommendations that would be the most helpful to agencies as they process FOIA requests. So as part of these discussions, we spoke with um, or learned more about the 10X process through GSA and that they're currently working on a project submitted by the Department of Justice to investigate a centralized way for the public to search across agencies' FOIA reading rooms. Um, we also spoke with 18S at GSA um, and learned about the services that 18S offers to help federal agencies improve government services through technology. And based on initial discussions, our subcommittee was considering recommendations of what an ideal FOIA intake and processing system would look like, certain functionality, that type of specification, um, particularly through the use of electronic discovery or artificial intelligence uh, software. However, we, during this learning process, we learned that um, we decided not to pursue this further because there's such a wide discrepancy in agency needs and there's no one size fit all 
even in an ideal world with an unlimited amount of money um, due to a lot of various factors, including agency size and complexity, the number of FOIAs received in a year. Uh, some agencies receive it, dozens, some receive several thousand. So it just wasn't going to be the most beneficial use of our time. So we've regrouped and are now focusing um, devising recommendations on the following four areas. One, best practices for the content of agency FOIA websites. Uh, two, releasing records in a standardized way, such as native CSV versus, say, PDFs for spreadsheets. Third would be using technology to increase proactive disclosure. And the fourth would be FOIA logs um, covering the inclusion of cert making, st having standards for what agency FOIA logs should include, such as minimal fields and creating a centralized repository across agencies. To sort of allow requesters to more easily learn what information has already been previously requested by others. That's the end of our technology subcommittee report. Okay. Uh, Jason, anything to add? No, thank you, Allison. Okay. Any other subcommittee members want to add anything? Okay. Lots of pilots. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're, let's move on to the report out from our classification subcommittee co-chairs, uh, Kristen Ellis and James Stoker. I don't know who's reporting out, so I'll let you guys take the lead. Hi, this is James Stoker. I'll be uh, reporting out today. Uh, the classification subcommittee has been uh, meeting monthly. The main issue that we've been working on is the issue of security-based GLOMAR responses to FOIA requests. Home law responses, as you will recall, are denials uh, that essentially are used to confirm or deny that an agency has any documents that are responsive to the FOIA request. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges in addressing the global law issue is understanding its scope. While there's a general impression that the use of global law responses has expanded over the years since it was first used in 1975, agencies do not regularly release information about their use of the global law exemption. Accordingly, we have distributed a questionnaire regarding the use of the GLOMAR extension for security reasons uh, to a set of 23 agencies and offices. Uh, we contacted them with our questionnaire about 10 days ago and asked if they respond to the question by deadline of July 15th. We have, in fact, already received one complete questionnaire response already, yay, and I hope that we will receive many more in the coming months. Her participation, of course, is entirely voluntary. Uh, we have no power to compel agencies to participate. However, we hope that agencies will see participation in this questionnaire as, uh, as um, compatible with the spirit of the FOIA to promote transparency about their, uh, their practices. Um, questions that we are asking include the following. We ask about um, their practices in regards to automatically issuing GLOMAR responses in uh, regards to all or certain types of FOIA requests. We ask them about how they track the number of GLOMAR responses they issue and whether they track the number of GLOMAR responses that they, that they issue. Um, we ask them for data about the number of GLOMAR responses that, they, that they've issued uh, to FOIA requests on an annual basis between 2015 and 2020. Uh, we ask for any information they have about appeals to GLOMAR responses during the same time frame, that's 2015 to 2020. We ask for information about litigation regarding GOMAR responses to FOIA requests in that same time period. Uh, we've requested any templates that they use for GOMAR responses. And uh, we asked whether or not they make public, whether or not they make information about GOMAR responses available to the public, any guidance regarding GOMAR responses, um, et cetera. And then finally, we ask whether or not a representative from uh, the agency's FOIA office would be willing to have a follow-up conversation about their use of GOMAR responses. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, in those follow-up conversations, we'll be able to answer uh, any questions that, uh, that we may continue to have or to clarify any responses that, uh, uh, that were uh, you know, essentially incomplete or not fully responsive to the question. After we receive the results of this uh, questionnaire, we'll process them and share them with the next full committee meeting. I can't promise that we'll have a recommendation by that point, but we should be getting close, hopefully. Um, so, um, if not, at the next uh, full committee meeting, hopefully the following full committee meeting will have a, a recommendation for the uh, committee's consideration. 
And uh, that's uh, pretty much what we've been up to. We're also considering our next uh, project uh, beyond the Goma, but I don't think we've uh, decided on uh, which project we'll be pursuing. So I'll hold off on discussing that for now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, James. I really appreciate it. Uh, Kristen, anything you want to add? Do not. James covered that beautifully. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anyone else from the classification subcommittee want to add anything? Okay. I'm hearing silence. Um, so also let me just open up the floor to the committee. Uh, any questions? of each other in terms of work that um, any of the four subcommittees are doing. Just want to give that opportunity. Okay, I'm hearing silence on that too. Um, any other questions about uh, anything that we've covered today before we move on? Because we've got about, we're a little bit early now on our agenda, so we've got about five more minutes before we turn to public comment. Just want to make sure everyone's gotten their fill of opportunities to ask questions or make comments. Okay. All right, here we go. So uh, let me now turn to the last portion of our agenda for today. Uh, we have now reached the public comments part of our committee meeting. We do look forward to hearing from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share. Uh, we do post on the Floyd Advisory Committee webpage any written comments we receive, as I noted earlier. Oral comments are captured in the transcript of the meeting, which we will post as soon as it is available. Um, before I ask Michelle to open up our telephone lines, I am going to ask Martha Murphy, our Deputy Director, to let us know if we have received any questions or comments via chat during the course of our meeting, either on WebEx or the NARA YouTube channel, that haven't already been brought up. Martha? Hi, Hi Lena, this is Martha. Um, we had two comments from Alice Howard. Uh, the first, uh, and, and neither relate directly to what's been discussed today. The first uh, mentions that it's almost five years ago the Department of Justice took comment on a proactive disclosure policy and U.S. civil society responded, encouraging adoption. What is the status of this policy at DOJ OIP? Hi, this is Bobby from the Department of Justice. Uh, thanks, Alex, for the question. The policy is still very much under consideration. I don't have anything official update to say today, um, but I just want to note that uh, proactive disclosures is this area that we've really focused on for a long time, and the, the, the pilot really still in release world. Pilot was a DOJ initiative, uh, something we're still very focused on. Um, the more we can provide records to requesters proactively, um, that's the most efficient way of increasing government transparency. And I think there's an inherent value in that, and uh, it also can, has potential to improve the FOIA process. Of course, when we did the release to one release all, there were challenges. Uh, many of those, uh, one of those in particular, um, the resources needed to remediate the records, uh, which is a, uh, a challenge focused on by the FACA for a, a number of terms also is a uh, focus of our work in the Chief Core Officer Council Technology Committee. Um, and uh, so uh, the more we advance in that area, I think it's going to be helpful for us to continue to, to move towards having even more records posted online. But beyond the release to one, release to all policy, um, the department's long encouraged releasing, proactively releasing records beyond those required by the FOIA. We're still doing that. We're still asking agencies to report on that. And we're still wanting to implement strong proactive disclosure policies. And along those lines, um, as, as uh, mentioned, Allison mentioned, uh, we are working and we're excited to work with um, GSA on the idea of a centralized FOIA search function of all the FOIA libraries, which would only enhance uh, the two will be very complementary. Um, so we're excited to be working towards a strong proactive disclosure policies, building on all the great work the agencies have done so far. Great. And now, second question. Um, is there any update on what has happened to the FOIA CAP goals? So, as you know, the CAP goals were established um, uh, a number of years ago to promote particularly two, two initiatives. One was the launch of the centralized FOIA website, the National FOIA Portal on FOIA.gov, and the other was to um, look into the increased uh, promotion of proactive disclosures policies. So, both of those we worked through and continue to get support from OMB on. 
Um, so they didn't go away. And, I, and in fact, the, the national FOIA portal, in a sense, the initial vision was, was, was completed and we're still getting strong support from OMB um, in enhancing um, the functionality of FOIA.gov, completing interoperability. As I mentioned, the search functionality is one. We also are starting to reach out uh, to get the, the agency and user feedback on other functionality that would be helpful on the National FOIA portal and our centralized website. And of course, as I just mentioned, all of our proactive disclosure efforts. Great, thank you, Bobby. Martha, and that's it for the chat comments. Okay, all right, uh, Michelle, uh, may I ask you to repeat the instructions for any public comments that uh, want to be made over the telephone line? Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to make a comment or have a question. Um, you would like to ask it over the phone, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the comment queue. Once again, pressing pound 2 will enter you into the, into the queue. And Michelle, do we have anyone on the telephone line? And it looks like we do have a question or comment that pops into the queue. Paula, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question or comment. <laughs> Yes, hello, this is uh, Bob Hammond again. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I, I've just been having a number of technical difficulties, uh, you know, today with uh, connecting. But in any event, uh, my first question is I, I submitted several comments via the chat window that's available to me uh, from the instructions that were provided. And I don't know if those go to the committee and even if they're being monitored. Uh, as I look at who's in there right now, uh, David and Alan are, and then there's one other person who appears to be a member from the public in the chat window. Are those comments being monitored and addressed? Uh, yes, Mr. Hammond, they are being monitored. Um, we are monitoring both on WebEx and on our YouTube channel, but um, I actually, I'm just asking the other uh, committee members, has anyone else seen any other comments from Mr. Hammond today? No. We have not. Okay, well, I think that's a technical issue. I followed the instructions for uh, getting into the WebEx. And again, the chat window to me only has David Collier, Alan uh, Bluestein, myself, and then there's a one uh, member from the public, so I'm not quite sure, and that's the only chat window that's available to me. Okay. We'll, that we'll sounds like a technical issue. technical issue. Yep, we'll work it out. Thank you for letting us know. Okay. Um, if I may, uh, I, uh, I had asked for an opportunity to brief a couple of topics today and to have the PowerPoint slides uh, presented. Uh, will I be able to do that? Uh, certainly, we're happy to give you a few minutes of our of the public comment period. Uh, we've circulated the PowerPoint slides to the committee members, uh, and they're posted on our website. Well, sure, but uh, you're posting PowerPoint slides for your presentations. I'm just asking if mine can be uh, posted so that I can make an effective presentation. I, I don't, we have not planned for that, and we can't accommodate that today, Mr. Hammond. I'm sorry. Okay. Perhaps you could summarize your slides. Well, uh, that's. I, uh, I think that's. If, if I may, with with respect, uh, I'd like the opportunity to be able to pre present those with the slides. There's a lot of information in the slides. Uh, they've been reviewed. Uh, and they're and they're posted. I don't know why I wouldn't be able to present them. If we're not able to do that today, uh, I would ask that I have the opportunity at a future meeting to be able to present them using the slides. Is is, it, is that agreeable? It is agreeable that you're asking. We will take it under consideration. Okay. I'll I'll jump in here, Alina, just really quick, because I know those slides are directed at OIP. And Mr. Hammond, we'd be happy to continue working with you um, and happy to uh, just, uh, put our position. Um, I believe your issues regard our, uh, our work in compliance inquiries um, and, uh, and as well as um, a disposition of an agency on reporting. I, I, my team will continue to work with you on those issues. 
Yeah, listen, uh, the, the comments are, are, are posted, and I was asking for uh, decisions at, in, in this public forum on the recommendations uh, that I made. Those would both require, uh, you know, your concurrence with those. And so, you know, since we're not presenting those uh, briefings today and, and they're posted, I'd be happy to uh, not present those in a future forum uh, if you're able to uh, review my recommendations and accept them, uh, then I don't need to brief those uh, slides. So I, I, uh, our office has gotten uh, your your views um, and we'll continue to work with you. Obviously, these, these are, um, you're, you're asking for decisions from my office. Um, but of course, as uh, Alina mentioned, the, the material is posted and everyone on the, on, the, on the FACA is welcome to look at them. We welcome anyone's recommendations and feedback. Um, Okay, well, how, how do I get decisions on the recommendations, including the, uh, I've submitted a number of public comments uh, asking for actions. How do I get public responses to those, if I may? I have to any question that you've had to my office, we, we have been responding to very respectfully and we'll continue to respond. Okay, well. And I apologize, I've got you on speaker. Uh, I was having other difficulties. Um, I guess we're somewhat at, uh, at an impasse on, on that uh, topic, on both those topics. Um, if, and, I, and Mr. Flavian, as in my briefing slides, as you know, I'm very complimentary of your office, uh, recent actions on uh, the uh, FOIA, uh, compliance inquiries. I know you guys are working hard on that. And, I, and you'll, as you know, my recommendations really have to do with uh, adding a little bit more uh, substance, some internal controls to those to make sure that they all get answered. And uh, obviously, uh, you don't have an answer for me today. That's fine. We've got some time over the summer before there'll be, I think, any more open meetings. I would appreciate uh, responses to those. Uh, two um, proposals, one regarding the compliance inquiries and the other one regarding moot determinations. And basically I'm asking that uh, the uh, that your agency uh, issue advisories, that those are not allowed and that they be discontinued and that FOIA appeals be adjudicated based on the uh, records at the time of the uh, administrative appeal. So I'd really like, you know, I'd really like to brief those with the slides because you miss a lot without the visuals. And I don't think there's a technical reason they can't be presented. Thank you and I appreciate the, the, the compliment. And like I said, our office is, is more than willing to go through all that, all that with you. Okay. I, I'm, I'm happy to work with you, but again, I'm, I'm seeking public responses. So uh, with that, let me just uh, let me just turn briefly. I, I submitted a couple of public comments that I believe are uh, completely in compliance with the posting rules and uh, in line with the uh, committee's charter, and I don't see those posted. Uh, what I would ask is, I, I'm not aware of anything that deviates from the guidance. In fact, they're very positive public comments, a lot of compliments in there for the FOIA Online Committee and others for the excellent work that they're doing and for your office and for OGIS. And so I'm confused as to why those haven't been uh, posted. Uh, I've submitted the same comment three times and, and uh, so I'd be looking for a response uh, if there's a reason they can't be posted. So, Mr. Hammond, I can address that. Uh, we've certainly been keeping track. You've obviously submitted, as you know, numerous comments, and we've been keeping pretty careful track. If we haven't had a chance to post them yet, uh, we will certainly look at them and ensure that they're up um, after the meeting. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Uh, some of these are comments that I submitted in March 
and May, and uh, they should be uh, not very controversial. So uh, I'll be looking for a uh, response on the two that haven't been uh, submitted uh, or haven't been publicly posted. Let me, let me just uh, make a couple of comments because I know we're not going to, you know, get real far with this. Um, as I said in my correspondence to the committee uh, recently, it's my humble opinion that in any discussion of FOIA, the requester is the most important person in the room. And uh, I don't presume to speak for all requesters, but is there anyone who would disagree with that? Okay. Well, I know many of the committee members uh, that spoke today are doing a lot of work to advocate on behalf of uh, FOIA requesters. I have uh, submitted a number of public comments that with, I think, uh, make the process much better, improve uh, compliance and, trans and transparency. And those are all actionable. I think uh, a number of those could be implemented uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and so I'm looking for responses uh, to those. Let me just, uh, let me just address one that, uh, that I submitted and asked for a response. And this would be a question for Mr. Flabian and, uh, Ms. Simo, uh, with my great respect. Uh, by emails of May 13th, 2021, June 4th, 2021, and I believe one after that, I submitted public comments for posting. The subject was uh, violations of the ADA and FOIA redactions. And therein, I noticed that I've been receiving FOIA determination letters that are not 508 compliant, as example, redactions in 5.5 point red font against the black background and not searchable, not having run OCR. And I asked for certain actions, including a DOJ advisory opinion uh, to agencies identifying the issue and the simple fixes. And Parenthetically, all Microsoft Office products, Word, they, they all have, and, and Adobe have built-in accessibility checkers. I run those before I submit things to your committee because your committee will not accept anything for posting that's not 508 compliance. To me, that seems like a quick and easy fix. Uh, there are a number of public websites that talk about how to make a document uh, compliant, but it's really just as easy as running the accessibility checker. So my question, uh, again, with respect to Mr. Talabian uh, and OGIS, will DOG OIP issue an advisory? And for Ms. Simo, the same question. Bobby, do you want me to take that first? Um, sure. If you don't mind. I, so, Mr. Hammond, we know about this issue. You've brought it to our attention. It actually does pertain to a particular case that you had with a FOIA request that was pending at a particular agency. So, as I made my statements earlier today, and I don't know if you heard them, we're really not here to address individual requests. We're happy to continue to work with you. Uh, and advisory opinions is something that is within the uh, scope of what OGIS is supposed to be doing. Um, uh, OIP issues guidance uh, and advice. We do issue advisory opinions from time to time, and, and it is something that we're looking at. So um, stay tuned. Yeah, if, if I may respond, and again, with respect. Go okay, ahead, Bobby. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, we issue guidance to agencies, and a lot of our guidance is informed from what we see from the respecters, requesters' perspective and what we see from the agency's perspective. So. I appreciate your continuing to contact my office and raising these issues. Um, it's, it's something that we continue to look to. Obviously, um, we encourage agencies to release information in open, most usable formats. 
Um, but first and foremost, the agencies responding to requesters um, provide those records in, in form or format that the requester requests and that's readily producible in that format. Okay, so let me, let me respond to two parts of that. Uh, first, uh, this is not just one uh, FOIA request. Uh, I get this a lot, so it's a big problem. It's real easy to fix, and so uh, I think if unless the unless there's some kind of a an advisory or something, uh, many agents agencies may not know that they're doing this, uh, and I'm other requesters may not know how to address it. And so what I'm asking for is, you know, some kind of public clarification to the agencies that says, hey, this is occurring, uh, and this is how you fix it. It seems pretty simple. Uh, and as you know, ADA compliance is a pretty important issue. Uh, we appreciate that, Mr. Hammond, and we're, we're definitely studying the issue you brought to our attention, and we very much appreciate that. Okay, I appreciate it. And, you know, the other thing as to, um, you know, public comments and addressing things, I'm not, I don't know if I, if I, if I ever put something in my public comments that you think don't comply with your posting requirements, I would really appreciate feedback on that. Uh, well, I actually need feedback on that, uh, to know what it is that, uh, OGIS or OIP, I think OGIS posts these, believes is not in line with the posting requirements. Um, so I appreciate that. The other thing in your public comments, when I read, and I, I read those, I read your guidelines very carefully to make sure that I comply, and, and I'm pretty certain that I do, but it also suggests that good submissions include anecdotes and experiences and those kind of things. It's hard to make broad generalizations about an issue without citing specific examples. And in fact, your public comments uh, call for that. So my intent is not to embarrass any agency or anything like that. But again, this is one that I think is kind of a broad issue. And so I'll appreciate uh, a public uh, response to that. Um, Again, since my comments in the chat room apparently didn't go to all of the um, members of the panel, I'll post those after the meeting or ask that they be posted as public comments. I have another one uh, that, again, this is uh, comments that I submitted on uh, March 3rd, 2021, updated on May 3rd. 2021 and submitted a couple times since then, I believe. Uh, but this one goes, uh, Ms. Simo, this is really to you. It goes to OGIS mediation and DOD's change to CFR 32 Part 286.4. Uh, and specifically in the CFR, CFR, the DOD states that participation and alternative dispute resolution is optional. This appears to me to be contrary to the FOIA, which states each agency shall and states the right. Shall and right are mandatory. They're not optional terms. Uh, in any event, it's my belief that DOD's CFR change is contrary to the FOIA statute's intent and also uh, and I believe, Mr. Clavian, I, I may have sent one or two of these over to you and I think also to OGIS, where DOD states on appeals of that issue where they've given an adverse determination and not included the right to seek dispute, re to seek, uh, dispute resolution or mediation through OGIS, DOD has stated that they're not required to do that. And as you read the statute, it says the right to seek dispute resolution with OGIS or the agency public liaison. I believe the intent of that is that the requester has the right to do both, but Navy has interpreted that more narrowly. So again, that's a comment I submitted back in March, and I, I'm looking for some uh, 
some action on that item. Okay, Mr. Hammond, we, we definitely have received that comment. We understand your concern. We're actually looking at the regulation so we can better understand what's happening. And we will address that with you separately and privately, not in this public comment forum. Um, and I'm not going to cut you off unnecessarily, but uh, we're rounding out the time of our comments. Public comments have exceeded 15 minutes. I want to make sure that we've given every, anyone else the opportunity to provide any public comments. So, Michelle, I'm going to turn over to you to see if anyone else is waiting on the line to make any comments. I currently do not see any other um, any other folks wanting to comment. But once again, as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, you can press pound two on your telephone keypad to get into the comment queue. Okay, uh, Martha, do we have any other chat comments that have come in? Um, so yes, and so Amanda Temple has directed everyone's attention um, to a couple of items. I have added them to the chat, um, made sure that they went out to um, all attendees. Um, the first um, directs everyone to OGIS's issue assessment on methods used to prepare documents for posting on agency FOIA websites. Um, and the second uh, refers everyone to our Chief Boy Officers Council Technology Committee um, that is looking into 508 compliance. There's some helpful links in the chat. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I suggest everyone take a look at what Amanda directed people to. I have put that out to all attendees. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, really appreciate everyone's participation today. We're uh, going to close our meeting. Uh, if anyone has any questions from the committee, uh, please speak now. Everyone's good? Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for all the work that they've done this far and very excited to have one recommendation done and behind us. That's great. Um, I also want to thank you for your anticipated work that's coming up in the next year. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for everyone's uh, comments. I hope everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. Uh, we will see each other again, most likely virtually, at our next meeting on Thursday, September 9th, 2021, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, any last questions or concerns? Okay, great. Um, we stand adjourned. Uh, one Thanks, second. everyone. Alina? Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you, do you anticipate that uh, next meeting being in person or uh, virtual? I, I anticipate it's going to be virtual. Thank you. And I will we'll obviously keep everyone posted. All right, any other questions from the committee? No. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for your hard work. Stay safe. We are now adjourned. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Today's conference has ended. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.